That's really interesting that there was the wrong diagonal included. That's two telescopes in a row with either a missing or incorrect diagonal. Am I missing something here? Why won't this finder scope go on the finder scope mount? Hey everyone, it's John Reed from Learn to Stargaze and author of the Things to See with a Telescope series and the new book 110 Things to See with a Telescope, the world's most famous stargazing list. Well, in a prior video, I reviewed this telescope, the Celestron Inspire 100AZ, a telescope which, at an entry-level price point of about 200 US dollars, met my requirement for a beginner telescope. Four inches of aperture, easy to point, bullseye finder, and so on. But thanks to inflation, that telescope is now, well, more expensive, possibly more than someone on a tight budget might be willing to pay. I get many requests to review budget telescopes, and one that comes up again and again is the Astromaster 70AZ, and I can see why. It's November of 2021, and this telescope is still only $129, and it's in stock. But was I excited about reviewing the scope? No, not really. The specs simply aren't that great. But then I saw something that surprised me. This box contains the Astromaster LT-70AZ telescope. In this video, we'll open it up and put it to the test. This is Learn to Stargaze. So I was watching another one of every astronomer's favorite YouTubers, Astro Biscuit. And in his latest video, he experiments with super budget telescopes those in the 100 pound range. He found that a long tube refractor from Celestron outperformed all his other budget scopes, at least on Jupiter. And I think I know why, but I'll get into that later. Astro Biscuit's video did motivate me to finally do this video. So thanks Astro Biscuit. I actually picked this scope up about a year ago, and the reason it took me a year to get to this video is because I kept coming up with different ideas on how to compare this scope to its higher aperture sibling. Let's start by looking at the differences. The most important quality of a telescope is its aperture. This 70AZ has an aperture of 70 millimeters. The 100AZ has an aperture of 100 millimeters. So does the larger telescope gather just 30% more light? Well, no. Follow me to the whiteboard. So what we're gonna do is divide the area of the larger telescope by the area of the smaller telescope. The pies will now cancel. And now we just plug in the numbers. So this means that the larger telescope collects 2.04 times as much light as the smaller telescope. Which basically means that more dim deep sky objects will be in the range of this telescope. And objects should look better too. But that might not be a fair comparison. The 100AZ seems designed for viewing deep sky objects. The included 20 millimeter eyepiece on this larger aperture telescope provides a magnification of only about 30 times. And that's great for observing star clusters and bright nebula. In many cases, the less magnification, the better. This 70 millimeter telescope seems to be designed for people who only want to observe the moon and see the rings of Saturn. And if that's your only goal, this smaller telescope should do the job. Well, let's open the box and put it together. Cue a time lapse. <laughs> All right, the box looks like it's in great shape. Let's open it up. All right, inside the box, we've got the instructions and a CD. Does anyone even have a disc player? It looks like there's an online download code as well. Now, personally, I don't use the software that comes with the telescopes. I like to use a software called Stellarium if I'm going to use astronomy software at all. All right, so the first thing I opened were the accessories. Starting off, we've got a 10 millimeter eyepiece, which with this telescope provides 70 times magnification. We've also got a 20 millimeter eyepiece, which provides 35 times magnification. Remember, you calculate magnification by dividing the focal length of the telescope by the focal length of the eyepiece and then multiplying by any barlows you might be using. Now, I notice there is no barlow included with this telescope, and that's probably intentional. Barlows are often overused and make finding objects in space much harder. However, I personally like observing the moon at over 100 times magnification, so in this case, the addition of a 2x barlow might be helpful. Now the maximum useful magnification of this telescope is only about 140 times anyway. You estimate maximum useful magnification by simply doubling the aperture in millimeters. If you wanted to observe Saturn, for example, with this telescope at the highest useful magnification, you might try a 10 millimeter eyepiece with a 2X Barlow. Now this is interesting. 
The diagonal that this telescope came with is a 45 degree diagonal. Now usually telescopes designed for looking at things in space include a 90 degree diagonal so you can actually look at things that are high in the sky. Interestingly, the picture on the box shows a 90 degree diagonal. Okay, the finder that came with this telescope is a red dot finder. They're not quite as nice as the bullseye finder that came with the larger telescope. Now bullseye finders are easy because it makes it easier to line things up with star maps. Um, but a red dot finder is the next best thing. So these red dot finders take a 2032 battery. Now I always forget to turn my red dot finders off and my batteries are often dead. So I keep a large supply of 2032 batteries on hand. All right, here is the optical tube and this is well packaged. All right, on first inspection, this is a really nice little telescope. It seems really well built. This is a Vixen dovetail. That means you can take it off the provided mount and put it on any premium telescope mount that you might otherwise have. This is a really solid looking dew shield. This can also come off like that. And remember folks, do not use your telescope to look at the sun. And now for the tripod. Here is the accessory tray and it looks like it came cracked. And here's the tripod. So this is a pan handle mount style tripod. So the way that this works is you rotate counterclockwise to loosen this axis here. And when you found your target, you turn it clockwise to tighten. All right, let's extend the tripod legs and put the telescope on the mount. All right, let's attach the finder scope. How do you attach the finder scope? <laughs> What's going on? Maybe I should have read the instructions. Thank you, junk drawer. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen these screws here on the side of the finder scope. It will then slide on. Maybe that's why they included this little screwdriver tool. Let's put on the diagonal and let's put in an eyepiece. Okay, as you can see, in its current configuration, this telescope is clearly designed for terrestrial observation, not for looking at space. For example, here we can pretend we're looking at a faraway mountain or vista. Now let's pretend we're looking at the moon high in the sky. And what if the moon was even higher in the sky? <laughs> ah, that's kind of awkward. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the junk drawer and see if we can get a 90 degree diagonal. You know what it's time for? Another garage scene. Success. Okay, now we're gonna replace the 45 degree diagonal with a 90 degree diagonal. And now, as you can see, looking at something in space suddenly became a whole lot easier. Now let's talk about observing the moon for a minute because that's something that you're gonna do a lot with a small telescope like this. I wanna know what the smallest object is that I can resolve on the surface of the moon with each of these telescopes. I'd also like to put my astrophysics degree to use. Meet me at the whiteboard. Now we wanna know how large of an object we can see on the surface of the moon with each telescope. So we've got moonlight, average distance to the moon is kilometers. Now we're gonna use the Rayleigh criteria of 1.22 times the wavelength over the diameter of the telescope lens. Plugging this into the calculator gives us radians. Now we're gonna calculate the resolution of the smaller telescope, radians. Now we're gonna use the small angle formula, which basically says that the angle in radians equals the distance on the moon divided by the distance to the moon. The distance on the moon that you can see with the largest telescope is 1.9 kilometers. We're gonna do the same thing for the small telescope. The smallest object we can see on the surface of the moon with the smaller telescope is just 2.7 kilometers in size. Make sense? Curve it. So this means that the smallest speck of detail you can resolve on the surface of the moon is 2.7 kilometers across. The theoretical resolution on the larger scope under two kilometers is clearly much better. But does this make a difference under real world conditions? We'll have to test that out. Speaking of the moon, if you enjoy observing the moon, definitely check out 50 things to see on the moon. This book gives you a list of targets to view on each day of the lunar cycle. In Astro Biscuit's video, his 60 millimeter long tube refractor offered the best views of Jupiter, despite having the smallest aperture. In other words, his real world resolution was the best in his smallest telescope. 
let me tell you my theory on why I think this is. When you're viewing objects in space from Earth, it's sort of like viewing light from the bottom of a swimming pool. The movement of the water causes the image to hop around. Now let's look at one rippled light wave. When it hits the telescope, you see a distortion in the image. This may come in the form of a shimmering planet or flickering star. Now imagine the telescope is smaller. Even though the wave front is rippled, the total distortion is less, resulting in a more stable image. Back in university, we covered this in a class on adaptive optics. Sky and Telescope actually had an article on this, and their conclusion for visual observation was somewhat mixed, attributing improved seeing in smaller telescopes to several other factors. In any case, the smaller aperture better seeing theory would support AstroBiscuit's experience that the smaller telescope showed superior views of Jupiter. Okay, the next thing we're going to want to do is align the finder to the telescope. This is best done during the day using a distant chimney, so let's do that now. Wait, it's snowing? <sighs> Whatever, let's do it anyway. Before using your telescope at night to observe the stars and planets, you need during the day to align the telescope to the finder. This is extremely important. I usually use a distant chimney. The first thing you wanna do is roughly get the chimney in the finder scope and then center the chimney precisely in the eyepiece. Now going back over to the finder, you're going to use the top knob to go left and right and the bottom knob to go up and down and you're going to turn these knobs until that dot is centered right on the chimney. And as a final check, you want to go back and forth between the finder and the telescope to make sure that they are both pointing at exactly the same spot. Before we go out to observe, it helps to come up with a list of targets beforehand. For a list of easy targets organized by season, check out 50 things to see with a telescope. And if you have kids like me, definitely check out 50 things to see with a telescope kids and parents too. Here is the 70AZ, and you can clearly see Jupiter and a few of the moons. And I would definitely have to agree with Astral Biscuit. It is sharper in this telescope than it is with the larger aperture model. And I believe that's because the higher focal length eliminates a lot of the chromatic aberration, um, higher focal ratio as well. And then also the smaller aperture, yeah, it's definitely less flickery than in the other scope. And here again is the 100 AZ, and you can see that the planet is, is bloated. There's spherical aberration um, that is causing the different wavelengths of light to come in at different focal lengths. And I think that's this telescope's biggest weakness. The smaller telescope is definitely showing a sharper image of this planet. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Astromaster 70 AZ telescope. If you've got one of my books, please leave a comment below. I absolutely love feedback from my readers. And please subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And remember, the future is looking up.